artists from around the world. We curate all of their content into different categories, comedy, drama, animation, um, you know, short, long, documentary, whatever it is. And we advance their careers. So last October, we had the first festival uh, year in Duluth. And there were over a thousand people from around the world that came in and uh, they screened their projects, they met each other. Uh, and the part of the, the process with television that's different from film is television's much more relationship-based industry. So it's really about getting to know the different writers and producers and creators that you might be working with on your project or that you're trying to sell your show to. Uh, unlike in the film world, where when you go to a film festival, you're showing up with a completed project in hand to sell somebody. Uh, in the television world, you're showing up with, with an idea or with just your first episode done. So we actively work behind the scenes uh, to advance as many people's careers as possible. Uh, there were a few local folks who had some great career advancement out of last year, um, last year's Catalyst process, and uh, we're looking forward to hopefully having more this year. Uh, so Catalyst has three parts to it as an organization. One is the festival. Uh, while it's the piece that we're most well known for publicly, it's actually the uh, smallest part of our focus. Um, the festival is just a, a five-day event. Uh, this year is scheduled to be September 30th through October 4th, and as of right now, we are going to be going forward with a limited, uh, abbreviated version of it based on what the Minnesota uh, state requirements allow us to do uh, in the fall. Uh, our primary focus is the Institute. So year round, we are a storytellers institute. We do labs and seminars and meetings uh, that help people learn all the different aspects of how to make a television series. So. In the, in the creative film and TV world, there are two different types of jobs, uh, two different types of job categories. There are above the line jobs and below the line jobs. Above the line jobs are your actors, writers, directors, producers, people who are very specific to that one individual project. Uh, the below the line jobs are all the crew and extra cast and post production and everything else that comes together uh, to actually make the production happen. And we'll talk a bit more about those details later. Uh, and then once the Institute is, uh, is churning out storytellers, we do our best to help them find locations and uh, places where they can shoot their future projects. Some of the people that are in Catalyst are, are brand new. They're, they're young students. They're maybe just in college, but they're super talented. They don't necessarily have a lot of money, but they've got great stories and uh, a great future ahead of them. And so we help them advance uh, their careers. Some people that come to us have won Emmys and are very famous and they're people that you see and watch on TV all the time. And they have projects that they wanna work on and they come to us looking for uh, help making relationships, but primarily they also come to us looking for advice on where to shoot projects. Uh, one great example of that, there's a top producer at Amazon Studios who we did a seminar with a couple weeks ago. Um, she has a major series, a uh, multi-part series about uh, life uh, um, as a part of a shipping family uh, in Lake Superior that she wants to shoot in Duluth. Uh, it's the millions of dollars per episode. It would be a great economic boost for Duluth. Uh, and it also happens to be a benefit that the producer, Melanie Marnich, uh, was born and raised in Duluth. Uh, she was born and raised in Morgan Park. Her dad worked at U.S. Steel. Her mom worked at the Teamsters. And she, uh, she became a playwright and is now a, a top big wig producer over at Amazon who wants to come home and bring Amazon's money here into our community uh, shooting her television series. And there's a reasons that we can't attract Amazon in those bigger series yet. And we'll get to that uh, as we go through. But there are ways, there are steps that we are actively taking behind the scenes in order to make that happen. So we, we've already checked off item one. We have the annual festival up on its legs and it runs every year. The Institute is running uh, year round. And then we're here today to talk about the third part, which is production. And this is really where we need the community support and we need your help and, and we need your time and effort uh, to help us get the message out into the community. And we'll have some action items at the end of this uh, that we can be asking you to do. So just a couple of quick examples. These are some photos from the festival last year. 
uh, we, we, our, our venues were Fickers, Graceland, uh, Zeitgeist, North Shore. Uh, and I just want to give a real quick thank you to a lot of the local businesses, uh, especially in the downtown district, who really helped make last year's festival possible. Um, people who, you know, were just so gracious with us being a new organization into town and really took the leap with us, uh, really became family members of ours. Um, you know, the, the folks over at, at, at places like the Radisson, um, the, the folks at Zeitgeist, the folks at Gray Salon, uh, and Fickers and the Boat Club and North Shore and, and the Downtown Council. And um, there were just so many others that, that, uh, that really came together and, and helped us uh, pull off a great event there um, right on Superior Street, even though the construction was there, but now that's done. So we'll have a, have a construction free festival this year. Um, here are some, some shots of the Institute in action. So we set up industry meetings and we have writing classes and seminars. Uh, thanks to the, the folks at Rathskeller and uh, Old City Hall, you can see that's where we were on the, the photo there on the top left. Those are industry producers that flew in from around the world and they came to Duluth, Minnesota to sit in the top room of the, the Old City Hall building to have their, their industry meeting. And that's really exciting because I think that the um, way that most people think about our industry is that it only takes place in Los Angeles or New York and that it isn't local to places like Duluth when in fact it, it is in fact hyper local to places like Duluth. Hey Philip. Hey. Uh, yeah. The, si the sides aren't um, changing it doesn't seem. Oh no. I've we're been still, like... Yeah we're still on the first one. Oh wait a minute. Hold on. That's why I was asking this. Okay let's see here. So what do you see? We just see the first. So it just says the cover page. Okay, I can figure this out. Hold on. <laughs> Here I am I'm like, I I through. no, I'm like four slides in. <laughs> oh no, okay. Uh, let's try it this way. Is going on here today, guys? We're being thwarted. <laughs> All right. Bailey, what slide do you see? Just the cover page so far. Still? Yeah. Hmm. What do you see now? Still just the, the cover page on here. All right. I am going to back out of this. And try again. Okay. Hold up. We will make this work. Okay, now it says thank you to our sponsors. All right, you see the sponsor page? Yep. Okay. Let me see if I can. Let's see if it moves once. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there we go. Ah, so what, do we do slide, our purpose? Okay. There, there we go. Yeah, so this slide better translates to everything I was just talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right, cool. We've got it now. Um, so there you go. Just to recap, uh, one, two, three, we discover, we curate, we advance um, all the storytellers from around the world, uh, how we do it, the festival, the, the institute and production, like I was saying, the festival and institute are already off and running. We're working on the production piece uh, and we'll get to how that works in a bit. Um, here are some, the photos that I was mentioning, uh, uh from Fickers and, and Graceland and North Shore and Zeitgeist. This was from the festival itself last year. And here are the Institute photos. You can see that top left one is the one I was talking about with the folks coming in from around the world to have industry meetings with each other. That was in the, the top of the meeting room at the old city hall there. Um, and the seminar and panel discussions, that's the, the theater inside Fickers, Spirit of the North, that is run by the folks at the, the boat club. Uh, it was amazing to find out how many local folks weren't aware there's a theater in there. It's tremendous. Uh, if you ever need to have an event, I highly recommend it down there. Um, all right, well, now that you can see my slides, uh, let's move on to what we're talking about today, which is the third piece of that puzzle, which is productions. Uh, so TV and film production, very simply, translates to uh, money and jobs. Uh, it's a multi-billion dollar global industry 
Um, I'll get into more numbers on that shortly. Uh, and it really mixes together the arts and blue collar labor, skilled trade, uh, and, and a lot of local businesses when a, a production comes to town. Um, the goal here isn't to just attract a production or have one film shoot in Duluth or have one television series film in Duluth. It's to have multiple films and TV series shooting simultaneously uh, so that there's a full uh, industry ecosystem that is in action year round, generating uh, jobs and opportunities for, for lots of folks. Um, the, the thing we always want to know locally is, well, this industry really hasn't historically had a, a, a long deep rooted home here. So why should I really care about helping to advance at being here? And the answer is that either you have a business or you likely know somebody who has a job or a business that could uh, fit in to being part of a production. And the, the sheer volume of money that can be spent on a production is actually quite staggering. Um, just a quick stat, the number one place where the most amount of films, major feature films were shot uh, last year was not Los Angeles or New York, it was Georgia, uh, down in the South in Atlanta. And that's because over 10 years ago, they started robustly going after this industry and they started educating people how to work the jobs that are on TV and film sets. and they started offering uh, f uh, incentive packages that made it viable for these productions to leave the big cities. Uh, they did over $9 billion with a B in TV and film production revenue in one year in Georgia, uh, just to give you a size of, of uh, scale of what's possible in places. Um, so when you look at the map of the United States, you have Los Angeles in the West, you have New York in the east, you have Georgia in the south, and the question we always like to ask is, where's the north? And we think that, that uh, can, there's no reason that can't be Duluth. Um, the, the things that you can do right now, first and foremost, is help us spread the word uh, that TV and film industry is interested in spending its money and creating its jobs here. Uh, there's a production guide that I'll give you a link for where people can sign up to say, hey, when productions come through, I'm interested in being the person who helps out with wardrobe or painting the sets, or I'm a carpenter and I wanna build the sets, or I'm an electrician and I wanna help rig out the, uh, the lights, um, those types of things. Uh, the second thing is more political. Uh, there needs to be a, a push from locals to city councilors and economic development leaders and folks at the city office and at the county to say that you're in support of this industry uh, coming here. So if you have any uh, ways that you reach out to your, your local elected officials, we encourage you to, to send them a note saying, hey, we, we've been hearing about this TV and film industry and we'd like to see it, uh, see it blossom here. Um, here are some photos from some productions, both small and large. Uh, you have some independent productions there, the Duluth Tribune, and then you have Game of Thrones with HBO up there on the top right. Uh, and most of the, uh, the biggest surprise we always get whenever we talk to, to people about our industry that aren't familiar with on the start is just the sheer volume of people that work on a set. So let's start talking about the numbers. This is really the bottom line question, which is, the TV and film industry is a $49 billion per year industry, according to the Motion Picture Association. And it pays money to over 280,000 businesses in big cities and small towns across America. Why aren't we getting any of that? Uh, there are dozens and dozens of states that are involved in getting a slice of this pie, and there's no reason that Duluth shouldn't be having it. Uh, the industry, the TV and film industry, is actually comprised of mostly small businesses. Um, lots of self-employed people, lots of uh, small production shops. And one of the interesting things about Duluth that the producers who came to the Catalyst Festival last year realized from the start was a lot of the businesses that the types of business that they would need to uh, employ on a set already exist in Duluth. 
So that's a, that was really positive, and there's been a great response from people saying that they are already interested in shooting future productions here. So we already know that the interest from the industry exists, both on small projects and larger projects, like I was mentioning Melanie's uh, Amazon project earlier. Uh, we just have to get Duluth ready to receive our industry, and there are some steps we can take to do that. Um, so here are uh, a whole bunch of stats from the Motion Picture Association. I highlighted a few that pertain to our conversation today. Uh, the first one on the bottom left you see there is that the direct industry jobs, meaning the, the people who are actually hired on the productions, um, it's a huge industry and it employs more people than other industry se uh, industries such as mining, oil and natural gas, uh, crop production and construction and others that you see there. Um, the, the second major point is about the wages and, and how much money are paid when, when they work on productions. And you'll see in the middle there, the total jobs and wages includes uh, the jobs and wages supported at thousands of companies that rely on the industry, caterers, dry cleaners, uh, lumber yards, uh, digital equipment, uh, consumer products, uh, hotels, hospitality, there, just the list goes on and on. The, the average salaries in our industry are pretty good. Uh, it's very rare that you find somebody making the state minimum wage. Maybe it's only on the super small projects that have really small budgets, but on the larger projects, uh, the, the studio and network size projects, they definitely pay better wages and usually they're unionized. Uh, one of the interesting things about our industry is you can get a job uh, on a production without having a college degree. Uh, there are positions open for production assistants and others who can start off on the lower rungs of the, the job ladder in our industry. And it's a great way for unemployed and underserved populations uh, to find a, a really good paying job. Um, and like I said before, you can see uh, uh, that last stat on the right the industry is comprised of mostly small businesses located around the country. Um, this one, th this stat really, I think, hits home for what we're going through in Duluth right now, in particular with the, um, the deficit that the city is incurring at a municipal level because of COVID. Uh, our industry pays a lot of tax money to the communities that it works in every year. Um, and simply based on the amount of productions that we know already are interested in coming to Duluth, if they were shooting on the ground this year or next year, once the, the, the industry has its COVID regulations figured out and everybody feels comfortable shooting full time, uh, it would be contributing greatly to making up a lot of Duluth's municipal deficit with the tax revenues that it brings in. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind as we all hear the ongoing conversations that I'm sure will accelerate over the next six months about uh, recovery and, and growth out of this COVID period. Uh, I, this map came from the previous slide, but I blew it up, which is why it's a bit grainy, but I just wanted to drive home the point. Each of these dots represents one of those businesses that uh, it's, it, we previously mentioned are, are involved in our industry. And you can see the west is LA, the east is based out of New York. You can see the hub around Atlanta down in the south and Florida and Louisiana have also been coming on strong in recent years. If you look at the Northland, we're one of the largest gaps outside of what, eastern Montana and northeastern Nevada. Um, we really have a chance here to bring a new region of our country uh, into our industry in a big way. And it's what has us excited to work on this project and, and it's why we wanted to, to share this with you guys today. Um, so let's take a look at the jobs. The, like I mentioned at the beginning, there are basically two types of jobs in our industry, above the line and below the line. Um, what you're seeing here are the folks who are involved in the pre-production and the development process. So for the writers and, and producers and directors, those are your uh, above the line folks. Um, but these would be the first sets of departments that they would go out and hire. Uh, sometimes pre-production can take 
couple months. Sometimes it can take six months. Sometimes it can take a year. It depends on the size of the project and the budget involved. Um, films typically will uh, have a shorter pre-production process than most television series. Uh, the the simple difference in the scale and the size between a film production and a TV production can be pretty massive. Um, so while all of these departments aren't necessarily hired on every project, you know, a, a 22 year old filmmaker who's just coming out of college, it, it probably doesn't have the budget to hire all of these departments. Um, the, the major studio features and network shows definitely do. Um, so these are just the people who are employed beforehand. Now, a lot of these folks will sometimes be uh, employed uh, in, from LA or New York where the studios are located and they'll work in their offices there. Uh, some of these people can be employed locally if we have a really good educational program that in workforce development training program that is uh, uh, turning out folks uh, with these with these skill sets and that's one of the things they've done really well down in Georgia over the last 10 years is the educational program of training people how to do as many jobs as possible locally has really made it easy for the industry to uh, to keep its money in Georgia by just hiring local people because it's think about it if you're a producer it is so much cheaper for you to hire somebody local to where you're going to be filming than to hire somebody in New York and fly them in and house them and feed them and all that stuff. So our industry would prefer to hire local, uh, but we have to get our educational and workforce development training programs up to speed uh, before we can do that. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, so once we get through the pre-production process, you actually get to the physical production part uh, process. and you can just see here the explosion of job types on this chart. I'm gonna leave this up for, for a little bit here and talk about a couple of things because this really is the heart of today's conversation. And if you remember nothing else from all of this, just remember this slide because either you or somebody you know probably works in or around one of these job types or has a business that works in and around one of these industries. Um, so starting on the left, you have the locations team. And the locations team usually are hyper-local. These are the people where the, the director will call up and say, hey, we need a, a school from the 1950s, we need a rail yard, and we need an ocean, and we need a forest, uh, a cabin in the forest. Go, go out and find us options. Oh, and we need a really cool looking mansion uh, from the 1930s, right? Obviously Duluth and the region has all of those things. And that's one of the first things that a lot of the producers from Catalyst realized when they got on the ground last year was just the diversity of locations and sets that are not just in Duluth, but within about an hour and a half drive radius is really a big money saver for them because there are sometimes on film or TV sets where they will shoot the same project in different countries just to get the right location. They will spend millions traveling hundreds of people across the world just to find the right looking mansion, like a Glensheen or a Gitche Club or something like that. And then they will fly them back across the world to another location that uh, looks like uh, one of the rail yards or the train museum or the depot. Um, to have all of those variety of locations in one area is, is a huge asset that we are, uh, that the industry isn't really aware we have in Northern Minnesota yet. Um, then you, once you have your location set, you have your set decorators. Uh, this is where uh, a lot of interior designers, exterior designers, construction people, uh, people who come out of a lot of the building trades will sometimes transfer their skills over into set decoration and construction. Um, props, obviously, is, is a real fun one. Um, oftentimes, uh, people, if there aren't prop houses in town, um, productions will go and talk to the local universities or schools that maybe have theater programs and talk about uh, or, or go to the local theaters and, and you know, partner up with them for props. Hair and makeup, obviously, is, is a big part of it. Uh, costume design as well. 
uh, all the different types of jobs that just go into uh, hair, makeup, and costume can be hundreds of people alone on a, on a major TV series. The, the art department, um, those are the, your set designers, and uh, they actually will oftentimes employ a lot of illustrators and drawers and storyboard artists um, uh, to you know, mock up what the sets would look like first before they actually go out and start buying all the construction equipment. Uh, to put it together. You have all your camera operators. Uh, grip and lighting. Grip is a unique industry term. It's basically the people that help with the camera department and the lighting department and a lot of the moving around of a, um, a lot of the equipment. Um, a lot of electricians will, will go to uh, learn how to take their electrical electrician skills uh, for set building, uh, but some of them also transfer over into lighting and into grip jobs. Um, grip is also uh, one of the jobs that sometimes you don't, you don't require a degree in order to get. Um, between production assistants and grips, those are sometimes two of the easiest ways that uh, unemployed or underemployed people can, can break in. Um, you have production sound and special effects. You've got down at the bottom left there, you have transportation. So, um, uh, you know, moving people around town, uh, all the drivers that will be hired and the coordinators. You have greenery. Uh, if you're watching a, a show and it's on location or it's filmed inside of a soundstage uh, and, you know, everything is, everything is planned out, right? So um, all the local nurseries and gardeners, uh, you know, could, could be getting involved. You have craft services uh, and catering that goes straight to the restaurants in the region. Um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of meals a day will be served three times a day, if not more, depending on how long the shoot day is on a major TV series. Uh, it's just, it's obscene money for local restaurants, especially if the productions are in town during, uh, during an off season. Um, uh, so I, I encourage you to really take a mental snapshot of this. Um, this is really the heart of what we're, what we're going after. And then once you have shot your show, um, there's all the post-production and the editing. So one of the things that locals say to uh, those of us in our industry as well, you know, it snows here six months a year. So why are you even thinking about trying to have this industry be here year round? And part of that answer is, well, sometimes they need, they need snow sets. Um, HBO spent a lot of money on fake snow to pr producing Game of Thrones in Northern Ireland. It's kind of funny. Um, so sometimes the, the winter scenes are good. But the other part of that answer is a lot of work gets done this day and age, especially post COVID in the editing base. And that's an indoor activity. Um, the post production, the editing, the visual effects, the sound effects, the music, um, all done uh, inside. And so I, we could see a scenario where from April through October, you've got productions running around town, spending all their money and shooting. And in the, in the uh, winter season, they are inside doing their post-production and, uh, and their editing. Um, so before we get to kind of wrapping this up and start taking questions, I just want to impress upon you a, a couple of things here. Um, one of them is scale. And this is not an exact breakdown of our industry. It, it's based off a, a lot of averages from a lot of re uh, information reported from different networks and studios. But it, our industry basically breaks down into these four categories. You have uh, at the far left, you have your smaller scale productions, your student films and your online series. Um, student film is more of a, uh, a term of art. It doesn't necessarily mean the, the person's physically a student, although they could be somewhere. Um, it really just means an independent, small independent production. Maybe it's sometimes five or 10 people, a group of friends that have a project they want to shoot, they get together. Maybe they raise a couple, a hundred thousand dollars. Maybe they don't. Um, they, they don't worry for the most part about shooting it uh, union. They shoot it non-union. They run around. They shoot for a couple of weeks. They edit together. It, it's, uh, it's where a lot of people uh, learn, uh, you know, what their artistic skills are and how to, how to tell stories. Um, then you have the, the indie film and TV. That's kind of the, the next step up. And this is the realm where uh, Catalyst, a lot of the programs that Catalyst uh, live. 
And these can have a wide budget range. These can be small budget at a couple hundred thousand dollars, or these can run up into the millions. Uh, they will mix their union and non-union crews. Uh, they'll be a bit bigger and the shoots will last a little bit longer. Uh, if you string together a couple dozen of those throughout the year, you can start to have uh, the semblance of a healthy, uh, self-sustaining TV and film industry in a town the size of Duluth. Um, but the real goal is to have the student and indie film and TV productions happening as training grounds locally and so that people are honing their skills and uh, creating relationships, professional relationships with each other, so that when the feature films and the TV series come into town and the feature film director says, hey, I need to find 40 people to work on my project. Do you know anybody locally? The student film and indie film community locally goes, oh, of course, we know all these people. We've worked with them before. They're great. They show up on time. They're responsible. They're kind to people on set. Um, it, it's, it's amazing how simple it can be to get hired sometimes in our industry where if you show up on time you're you're responsible in your duties and you're nice to people uh sometimes those will be the only three things that the person hiring you will care about um, especially on some of the, the more lower level jobs um, so when those feature films come into town now you're starting to talk bigger budgets and when we start talking about the the bigger projects i don't want you to think that these are out of reach because Last year, we took a contingent of St. Louis County Commissioners, Speaker of the House, Melissa Hortman from Minnesota, Representative Dave Lizelgard, um, and, and a few other folks came out with us to Los Angeles, and we sat in the room with HBO executives and with Disney executives and, and others, and they told them, these executives told them, they have Minnesota-based films and stories that they wanted to shoot in Minnesota, but couldn't because we didn't uh, have the things that they needed in terms of locally educated uh, crew and uh, production incentives at a, at a local and statewide level. So these things are within our reach already and there's already an de active demand from our industry wanting to be here on the ground. Uh, we know for a fact that there have been tens of millions of dollars of missed revenue in the last two years alone in the Duluth region uh, because uh, the, of the of the lack of infrastructure that we have, which is what we're working on building. Um, and then kind of the holy grail uh, scenario is a TV series. When, when a location is uh, lucky enough to land a TV series, uh, it can change a place for a generation. And that's not an exaggeration or hyperbole. Um, on the bigger end of that scale, you have something like Game of Thrones, which literally changed the economy of Northern Ireland. Um, you have Breaking Bad, which changed the economy of, of New Mexico. You have The Walking Dead, which is part of the reason that Georgia took off. Um, the, uh, on and on and on with the examples. Um, a series like the one that Melanie Marnich, the Duluth local I mentioned earlier, wants to bring to town with Amazon's money would fall into that category. She's a big producer who produces big shows. Um, so it's important that when you hear people talk about the TV and film industry, that sometimes the argument will be made, oh, what, what good is it to just have one or two small independent art films uh, shooting around town? Uh, that's not really a full industry. Why are we giving a couple hundred thousand dollars to that? And the answer is it's important because it's growing the local artistic uh, community and professional community, but it's also giving the, the non-production community uh, a taste of how our industry works. And once you start opening the floodgates to artists and, and our region starts supporting these artists on the smaller scales, the word will spread, right? When a, when a art, artist in Duluth gets a grant from the Arrowhead Regional Arts Council is, or the city of Duluth or IRRRB or the state of Minnesota or some other entity to shoot their project in our town, I promise you that that artist is so excited about that grant, they are telling their entire artistic community around the world online that Duluth, Minnesota is supporting their work. Whether that grant is a thousand dollars or a million dollars, um, they are promoting Duluth's good name out to the artistic world. And as soon as producers in our industry start hearing 
Duluth, 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 Minnesota, Minnesota, Minnesota enough from various different people, they're going to start going, hey, what's, what's going on up in Duluth here? Why, why are we missing the boat? We need to start spending our money there. They're being so supportive of the artist community. Um, and that's something that uh, Duluth, that's part of Duluth's roots, which is why we moved Catalyst there and we're, we're rooted there now too, is uh, the strength of the art, local artistic community. So the other big question is, why are we working on this now? Um, obviously, everything going on in the world of COVID, um, you know, our, our production is going to be able to get back to, to shooting again regularly. Um, when will there be a vaccine? How is the local business community going to respond? There's a whole bunch of what ifs. Well, we have a lot of work to do in order to get ourselves ready in order to handle some of those larger projects like the feature film and the TV series. We are not really ready for something like that to come into our community yet. Um, it's going to take us another, we've already, at Catalyst, we've been working on this now around the clock for 18 months. Um, Ricky McManus at the Upper Minnesota Film Office has been here for 30 years. Um, back in the day when there was uh, shoots like North Country and Iron Will going on. Um, so all that groundwork that's been laid over the previous decades um, is really kind of leading to this, to this big opportunity point for us. And one of the pressures that's happening in the television and film industry because of COVID is there aren't enough physical sound stages and locations in Los Angeles, in New York, in Atlanta to handle the demand of production anymore, especially since there's been a shutdown for a few months. And when things do get back to normal, which by the way, they're estimating is going to be early next year. Um, there are gonna be a couple productions that are gonna try to shoot over the fall, but everybody's anticipating that some of those crew members will get sick and the industry will shut down again and that it'll all pick up again at the beginning of next year once there's a vaccine. Um, there are going to be so many productions that need locations to shoot. Uh, it's, going to, it, it, it's going to be a missed opportunity if we, aren't, if we aren't fully ready with our arms open saying, hey, come here, we want your jobs and we want your money. So here's, here's a list of things that uh, we're asking people to pick and choose from to help us do. So starting on the top left with organizing our local resources, um, with the support of St. Louis County and the IRRB and the city of Duluth and some local business sponsors last year, we were able to create a production guide, an online production guide, which is the first step that any serious state or municipality takes when they wanna show our industry that they are ready to, uh, to take, on the, take on the jobs. Uh, and what this is, is this is a free listing of all people in businesses in our area who uh, want to potentially be hired on a TV or production set or film production. So going back to this, this jobs chart, any and all businesses that are associated, all the restaurants, all the hotels, everybody in hospitality, um, all the carpenters and plumbers and electricians and drivers and hair and makeup and costumes and locations and sound and lighting and, and editing and everything else should all be listed in this production guide. The link is there. Uh, you can also go to the Catalyst website. You'll see a production, uh, a menu section called production. You click on that and you register yourself. The way that guide gets used is when an outside producer comes in and says, hey, uh, we have a project. We want to shoot it here. We need 50 crew members and we need these crew members that have these particular skills. We need uh, this many hotel rooms. We need this type of restaurant, blah, 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 blah on and on we will refer to this production guide first and say, okay, great. Here's a list of 10 businesses that you should be calling uh, to get bids from for your production that's coming into town. That goes through the production guide. Uh, the next step is building sound stages and organizing physical spaces. So the first two that come to mind are the Armory and AAR. Um, I had a conversation with a friend at HBO recently who uh, operates the sound stage department. And I found out uh, through, you know, through the grapevine that the rent that a network or studio will pay to rent a soundstage facility such as an AAR space is about 10 times more than what the city was paying or what AAR was paying the city for the rent of that same space. Um, our industry comes in, spends a lot of money quickly uh, and if they really like the place that they shoot, they will then start signing long-term leases in those, in those locations. 
Um, so anybody who's listening that has a business in real estate or who has friends that work in real estate, this is where the real the local real estate industry is going to play a big part in this. Uh, Netflix is buying up properties in New Mexico and around Brooklyn, New York to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars uh, and renovating them and bringing them up to date in order to use them as sound stages for five, 10, 20 year leases. You know, imagine some of the, the buildings and locations around town like Central High School and the Armory that have just been a constant source of conversation about renovation and, and money uh, needing to be put into them that we use Hollywood's money to renovate these spaces because they're leasing them out. And then when, if and when they ever leave, the city ends up with these tremendous resources that have been uh, up, updated and renovated without, um, with, with outsiders' money. Um, tax credits really come into play on this uh, at a local level and at a state level. There have been two bills introduced down in St. Paul, one in the House, one in the Senate, uh, to reinstitute a big statewide production tax incentive. Uh, we're also talking with folks at St. Louis County about doing a county incentive and friends at the city about doing it on a city level as well. Um, I, I'll digress there for one second. One of the real interesting hurdles towards getting those incentives in place is a lot of the elected officials get the sense that um, they may get blowback from the public community if they were to announce that they were giving incentives to uh, the TV and film industry. So this is where it becomes really important as the business community to let those elected officials know, actually, we want those money, the TV and film money and jobs here. We, we're gonna support you in that. Um, the, moving to the second column, um, having friendly procedures like permitting, super simple stuff. Um, I mentioned the financial incentives. Um, the workforce development programs, we're talking with folks at LSC about launching the workforce development training program there to uh, help retrain uh, local, uh, local labor folks on how to, to work on a TV and film set. So keep an eye out for, for more news on that. Um, and then once all of these things are in place, you've got the local training, you've got the sound stages, you've got the incentives, Catalyst reaches out to the industry and says, hey, Duluth's ready to go, let's get shooting. Um, final slide just to leave you with before questions. Uh, I mentioned earlier that a TV series can be the holy grail. This is an example of some of the numbers that came out of Game of Thrones. Um, Game of Thrones has, and, and major TV series have two types of employees, if you will. One, actual employees that they hire to that production that work full-time jobs. And then they have the second component, which are all the outside vendors all the 1099s, all the locations that they use, the hotels, the restaurants, et cetera. If you look at just the full-time employees that were hired on Game of Thrones, it was more than Minnesota Power, UMD, and Cirrus have combined. Um, and like I said, that doesn't even include the local vendors and other businesses. Uh, and you can see there on the money, uh, under the money slide, uh, some examples of they, they bought almost 70,000 hotel room nights. Um, I don't even know how much money that is on hotel rooms. And I don't know what Duluth does in an, in an annual year, but I'd imagine that would be a pretty good impact. Um, of course, this was spread out over the course of a few years, but still, it's, it's a great example. Um, and it also just shows some of the other things that they spent their money on uh, that, you know, we all know that some of the heavy industry businesses in Duluth could benefit from. Um, so that is a lot of information. I know, um, Bailey, I'm uh, happy to share this slide deck with you so that anybody who's listening or watching can link to it somewhere, I guess, on the Chamber site or whatever, so that people can refer back to it and share it with their friends. Um, but at, at this time, uh, we, I think we have like 10 minutes if anybody wants to ask any questions about all that stuff. Sure, so I have the chat open or feel free to unmute your microphone and turn on your video if you'd like to. I hear somebody. Yeah. Is it Rob? Yeah, hi, Philip. Um, hey, Rob. 
We've met at UMD and yeah. talked about uh, school programs and whatnot. I'm really excited that you're working with LSC about uh, uh, workforce development. Uh, what uh, can you take a deeper dive into uh, the financial um, uh, types of incentives? You know, you were talking about. I'm excited to hear about St. Louis County and and uh, and the city of Duluth and things of that nature. What 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 are some of the particulars of that? Great question. So the, the work that we've been able to accomplish so far um, in, our, in our efforts have been a lot of education uh, for the elected officials about the industry and how incentives can work. Incentives typically happen in one of two ways. They're either a, a cash rebate, meaning uh, you come in with your project, you spend your $5 million first, and you have an agreement with uh, the city or the county or the state that after you spend your money locally, uh, you would submit your receipts for money that you spent in the local Duluth businesses. And the county or the city or whoever it is that's running the program would write you back a check for whatever the percentage is, mm -hmm. 5%, 20%, whatever. Um, it's important to know that in that scenario, uh, the municipalities do not spend money up front. This is not a, let's give the producer $5 million in hopes that they return us an ROI. This is, we're giving them a rebate on money they've already spent in local businesses. Mm -hmm. um, the second version that, of an incentive are the, the tax incentives. And those operate a bit differently. Those operate on a larger scale. Uh, usually cities and, and counties don't have the tax base alone to do them, although St. Louis County may be the only exception in the country we're looking into that. Um, they're usually done at a state level. And the way those work is I come in with my production and let's say the budget's $40 million. And Minnesota has a tax rebate, a tax incentive program for 20% of my budget. Um, so I now have from the state of Minnesota, a piece of paper that says, I'm gonna get $8 million off any future tax liabilities that I owe to the state of Minnesota, right? 20% of my 40 million. Well, I may not have an $8 million tax liability in the state of Minnesota because I'm only you know, shooting here for half a year and I only, I'm only spending $40 million. So what I do is I go to US Bank or I go to Wells Fargo and I sell them that piece of paper, that tax certificate for 80, 90 cents on the dollar. There's a third party market out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I take my check from US Bank. They take that piece of paper and take $8 million off of their 2024 state taxes or whatever it is. Um, again, in that scenario, it's really important to know no Minnesota money is, no, Minnesota doesn't cut a check to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, there's no handouts up front uh, or anything like that. So in both scenarios, it's a situation where we're asking for permission for the communities to say to our industry, yes, we want you to bring your money here under a good faith agreement that we will work with you on some type of a rebate or an incentive program on the back end. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent uh, uh, example or, or explanation of the two different uh, systems there and two different incentives. Uh, what, what is Snowbait still alive? Is that dead? Uh, uh... Um, it exists. And, and that's where you get to the, the stumbling block that we've run into at all levels, city, county, and state, which is scale. Um, Snowbait is an extraordinarily embarrassingly small program. It is mm -hmm. capped at $500,000 per year. And it's set at 25% of a production's cost, which means one $2 million independent small film eats up the entire Snowbait for yeah. the whole year. You can't go to Disney who wants to spend $40 million in Duluth and say, hey, here's $500,000. That just doesn't work. They go across mm -hmm. the border to Canada or they go down to Georgia. Um, this is where the public and, and you and the others listening in the chamber and, and Apex and all the other organizations out there really need to get into the ear of the elected officials at the local and state level mm -hmm. and, and make them unafraid about the scale. Uh, of what we need to do, right? If we announce a program with St. Louis County, it needs to be in the millions just for starters. It can't yeah. be, hey, let's try a $50,000 program, see if it works. It's not going to work. Um, so Snowbait is going to hopefully go away once the statewide tax incentive program takes takes over. The House bill that Dave Lizelgard introduced, I believe has a $30 million mm -hmm. uh, incentive okay. cap per year. The um, And that bill is bipartisan. 
um, I forget the gentleman's name, he, the Republican he has in the House working on that with him. Um, the Senate bill introduced by uh, Republican Senator Karen Housley um, and co-sponsored by Thomas Sony um, goes up to 110 million. Wow. So they, after last year's meeting when Speaker Hortman was in LA and had HBO stare her in the face and say, we would have been spending this money in your mm -hmm. state. I think it really hit home. Um, Fantastic. And so the state, it seems to be getting it. Um, but now we need to focus on the city and the county. And obviously, you know, with the city, I would think it would be a really great way for them to generate tax revenue up front to help fill the budget deficit without having to spend any money on the back end until a rebate is handed out, you know, a year and a half down the road. Mm -hmm. Great, great. And you have cheerleaders like Melanie Marnich who are anxious to come home and to, and to create product. <laughs> Melanie, wants to, Melanie wants to a lot of Amazon's money in town. Yes. Yeah, yeah. let's make sure that happens. <laughs> We're trying. We're trying. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't like to see myself here. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's good, good to see you from the Swiss Alps there. You bet. <laughs> Do you have any other questions? No? Oh, so here, Jamie. No, making that up. Okay. I don't see any more on the chat either. You don't have any sent to you, over to you privately. Chat. Oh, that's where you guys were all yelling at me at the beginning saying you couldn't see anything <laughs> with the title page. <laughs> I just didn't, I wasn't looking at that, sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, okay, well. All right. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And if nobody has any more questions, they, thank you very much for being with us today, Philip. I really appreciate it. That was. That was great. I learned, I learned a lot. Oh, looks like we do oh. have a question. From Sandy Johnson. Uh, at this time, are you able to attract productions here without the incentives in place? Short answer is no. Um, we, we might be able to attract a couple of small student film productions, um, but nothing that's going to um, move the needle in any way or offer any type of significant uh, support. An interesting thing about the incentives is timing. Um, if if Duluth, St. Louis County and the state of Minnesota were to today announce incentive programs, um, nothing would even start shooting here for six to eight months probably because that's the amount of time it would take for the pre-production process to be happening. So it's really more about the press release and us being able to say to our industry, hey, we're open for business here um, before things would even, even get rolling. Um, you know, the between pre-production and COVID, I couldn't really see a major production shooting on the ground in Duluth until spring next year. So any time that we spend delaying now, if we don't get to make the announcement until the end of December, that's a whole nother year. We're probably not going to get any productions then until 2022, just because we're waiting on an announcement. Um, so Sandy, the short answer is no. Uh, you have to go big. Our industry works in, in big sizes and big scales, and uh, that's really the only way to do it. Uh, how much is needed? Um, you know, the state programs that are being announced in the 30 to $100, $100 million range uh, would be enough to start attracting the major productions. On a local level, um, if the county and city were to, to come together with a program, we'd want to announce that there's at least somewhere in the range of five plus million dollars to start with that's, that's in the pot um, that would eventually be paid out through either rebates or, or tax credits down the road. That would be a good starting number. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Philip.